to be with you this morning and indeed for those viewing online and if you're new with us then uh, a special warm welcome to you too and I hope we can get to know you after the service. There are very few things I think in which we can put our hope and trust in these days but in Christ alone, in Christ alone, our cornerstone, we can always, always put our hope and trust particularly during tough times. Through the storms of life, he's always with us. Well, as many of you will know, we're going through a sermon series looking at the identity of Jesus. And Phil will be speaking to us a little bit later with the theme, I am the life that rises, raises the dead. Now, isn't that something that we can put our hope and trust in? And it is great to give thanks and praise to the God in whom we can trust. 
uh, and cast our cares upon him. So please will you all stand to sing all creatures of our God and King. please be seated for our confession. And just before we say our confession together, let's just bow our heads and raise to God the things where we know we've disappointed him. Let's just have a few moments quiet. The psalmist said, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, 
so great is his love for those who fear him. Let's say the confession together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned, thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. So may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to, to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say the collect to each other. We say together, Gracious Father, you gave up your Son out of love for the world. Lead us to ponder the mysteries of his passion, that we may know eternal peace through the shedding of our Saviour's blood, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's just before the, the kiddies uh, leave to their groups, I always like to test them on our verse for the year, our Bible verse for the year. I can't see too many kiddos here this morning. Now, can anyone remember, if you're under the age of this high, can anyone remember our Bible verse for the year? I'm looking round. Any hands up? Do I see Martha? Shout it out, Martha. Come on. Well done. That could be very dangerous, throwing a packet of Harry Bays. I could have hit someone on the head there. Well, that's fantastic. And I know one of these days I'm going to ask the adults. I'm going to ask the adults. In fact, come on, adults. Let's say it, let's say it together. Our verse for the year is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, that's fantastic. A round of applause to you all. Right. Just like to keep you on your toes, that's all. Just before they go, let's bow our heads in prayer and I'll say a prayer for the younger ones. So Father God, we just thank you for your love for children and how precious they are in your sight. May they grow in faith, walk in faith, and in due course proclaim their faith to you. Amen. So kiddos, off you go. And whilst they're going, why not chat to the person next door to you? It's good to keep in touch with the neighbours, isn't it? Well, Jesus came from heaven to earth to show us the way and the truth and the life. And that he came to save us all. To pay our debts for, by dying on the cross in our place. So let's stand to sing praises to him, lifting his name on high.
seated and let me invite Beryl to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for Jesus' fantastic promise that he is the resurrection and the life and that whoever lives by believing in him will never die. Thank you that these weren't just empty words, but that he himself went on to die on the cross and then came back to life again. We pray you would help us all to believe him and to live our lives getting to know him better and better. Thank you for the joy and hope that trusting in him gives, not only for the future, but for meaning and purpose in our lives now. We pray that this Easter, many more people around our country and the world would hear this message of hope and put their trust in him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, around the world there are so many tangled political situations, they seem impossible to solve. We pray for all in positions of leadership and influence to use their power for good. Wherever the ears of the powerful seem deaf to the cries of the oppressed, please raise up leaders with ears to hear your guidance and act on it. May conflicts be faced honestly and needs recognized and met. We long for an end to the many conflicts and for peace, especially in Gaza between Israel and Hamas and in Ukraine and in so many other places where there is war and oppression. Please help all who are working for peace and justice to persevere and strengthen all who are working to provide the hungry and homeless and caring for the the thousands who have been injured and bereaved. Please give them all wisdom, energy, skill and the resources that they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today we pray especially for Food Bank here in Chesham and around the country. Thank you for all who give to it especially for all the volunteers who give their time and energy to help those in need to provide for their families. Please strengthen and encourage them. Numbers using the food bank have increased greatly this past year, and the food bank network is calling on the government to guarantee the essentials in life so that everyone would have enough basic income to be able to afford food. We pray that the government would respond favourably and provide money for those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are sick at this time, remembering King Charles, praying that he would respond favourably to his treatment, and also for the Princess of Wales, pray that they would both return to good health again. We also remember those among us who are sick. James Alcock to recover well from a a nasty fall this week. Nigel Edward Few, who is to have surgery tomorrow, praying that the procedure would go well. Catherine Bett, that she may receive relief from her severe back pain and know God's presence with her and our rector Edward's sister, Caroline, that she may know your peace as she copes with chemotherapy for lung cancer. We also take a moment to pray for others known to us in need of healing and help, including John Leach, Betty Norwood, Pamela Clements, Eddie Brown, Ray Monk, and Tris Story. Lord, may each of them know your peace and your strength and receive the help that they need. And finally, in a moment of silence, let us bring 
this coming week to God, lifting up to him anything that we feel concerned about. And we bring our prayers together by saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Beryl, thank you so much. Could I invite Phil to give us some bands of marriage? Hi, so I publish the bands of marriage between Nicholas Jean-Marie Goutel and Jessica Natalie Stark, both of this parish, and this is for the third time of asking. So if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Let's pray. Lord, the source of all true love, we pray for Nicholas and Jessica. Grant to them joy of heart, seriousness of mind and reverence of spirit as they enter into the oneness of marriage. May they be strengthened and guided by you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Uh, hey, we've got some notices coming up. Uh, yeah, we've got quite a few notices, so listen up, everyone. Uh, choral Evensong this afternoon. If it's your type of worship, then please do come along. I think there are more and more numbers attending each day. It's from the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, so if you can attend, then please do. Uh, tonight, yes, there's a pastoral care course. Um, I went to the last one. It was, uh, it was really interesting, training, equipping, discipling. If you're interested in, in pastoral care, you don't have to be part of the team, then please uh, turn up at the church rooms just before seven. Uh, we've got quite a lot going on this Easter. Um, the Maundy Thursday, I was hoping that was coming up. I don't, has anyone put their names down for Maundy Thursday, the evening meal? Yeah, not, not many, but if you can, then please do attend. I think it's a great time to have fellowship together. Uh, and if you're intending to, then please put your name. You've got to sign up, put your name down today, because those organizing the food, they need to know how many to be catering for. Uh, I know it's not going to be feeding the 5,000, Liz, but I hope we can all get together as a church family and celebrate what's coming for Easter. Uh, yeah, the, the Good Friday Parish service, uh, it's a lovely service where all the churches, all our seven churches from around the parish come into St. Mary's uh, and celebrate Good Friday. Uh, it's only a week on Friday where it's amazing how quickly Easter's upon us, isn't it? So please come, come along to that. Uh, the kids' Easter experience, I believe it's, uh, it doesn't say on there, but I think it's from years 6 to 11. Once again, uh, booking is required, uh, so please, you know, we can have as many kids as we can, but sign, sign up for that. Yes, one, one to six. One to six. One to six. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I could have been in deep trouble there. Um, uh, and for Easter Day, uh, we have uh, uh, communion at 9 and 11, uh, and there's an Easter praise, which would be lovely if we can attend at 6 p.m. that evening. So uh, um, it'll be a great way to celebrate and give thanks to our Lord Jesus. Uh, the Good Book Club, uh, yeah, the, the, the word for working women, it's at Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the rectory. Uh, so please, if you can come, do come to that. Uh, a quiz night, um, yeah, it's Saturday, as you can see, at 7 p.m. Uh, at Emmanuel. Uh, it's, it's to help uh, our trip to South Africa, um, £12.50. It does include food. Um, I'm, 
once again, please do sign up. Uh, it'll be a great way to celebrate together and raise some money for South Africa. Uh, and on, in the same breath, Alison Roots, she's so brave, this lady. She did the parachute jump uh, and raised two and a half thousand pounds for this trip to South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> I hear there's more money on the way, and it's not too late to sponsor, is it, uh, uh, Alison? So if you want to sponsor, a lady of great courage, and it looks as though you're in one piece as well, so <laughs> praise the Lord for that. I think that would be terrifying. I'm not sure I could jump out of a plane, but anyway, well done, Alison. Any others? Uh, well, there's, there's lots to look through, lots to pray for. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, especially ahead of Easter, um, please... Write these things in, in your diary and pray for them. Paul, can I invite you to give us our Bible reading? And then Phil will unveil the treasures from this scripture. Thank you. Well, we have a terrific Bible passage to read together this morning. You'll find it, it, it's in John's Gospel, chapter 11, starting at verse 17. And it's in, if you've got the Church Bible, it is on page 1078. John's Gospel, chapter 11. <clears throat> on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. After this... After she had said this, she went back to and called her sister Martha aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary, Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews heard who had been with, G uh, with Mary in the house uh, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she, had, she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she saw him and fell on her feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and also the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. 
I knew you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Paul. Let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, wherever we stand with you right now, may we leave here today taking hold of the truth and the comfort of this promise of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Cryogenics. For a hefty fee, cryogenics companies offer eternal life, or so they say. Essentially, the promise is that in exchange for your gold, you'll be frozen until, well, that's just the issue. No one knows when, how, or if it's even possible to de-thaw a frozen corpse. And what if it's never possible, which is highly likely? Cryogenics all seems rather hollow, almost a bit of a con, you might say. And whilst you shell out your hard-earned coin in the vain hope of a future de-thawing, those peddling that promise are just raking the cash in. You could argue that such firms really ought to have their assets frozen. But it's a novel approach to an age-old problem, death. Sort of the best efforts we can make to solve it. And all around the world, people have tried to avoid death and delay it for as long as possible. But why? Because we don't want to die. Life is such a wonderful gift. Look at us all here this morning. Enjoyed your breakfast, came here. You're free to do so, free to worship God, have fellowship together. Perhaps afterwards you'll go off and enjoy the afternoon with friends or family, have a nice, nice lunch. Life is a great gift. We don't want to die. Today I'm going to claim something outrageous. I'm going to explain how to beat death and live forever. I'm not talking about some secret elixir or advanced cryogenic technology, like in some work of fiction, but about meeting, encountering a person. I'm going to introduce you, perhaps for the first time, or maybe more deeply, the one who can save you from death and give you everlasting life. This is what Christians believe. This is what the church is built upon. We're in chapter 11 of John's Gospel today, and as we continue on in our series, our theme, this uh, sermon now, is Jesus is the life that raises the dead. Now, throughout our series so far, the miracles Jesus has, Jesus has performed pointed to something deeper. There are these seven signs that build throughout John's gospel, helping us see who Jesus is. They're not just events that happened randomly, they were part of a purpose for revelation. So we've seen that Jesus has power over nature, over his creation. Well, we saw that with the turning of water into wine, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water. We've also seen that he has power over sickness, in healing the official son and the man at the pool. But as we approach John 11, we're approaching something more serious. The stakes are being raised. 
And that's because death is our great problem. Death is our great problem, yours and mine. Now, I'd like you to keep your Bibles open because we'll be looking back a little bit before verse 17 to get the context of what's going on here. But essentially, the question put forward at the beginning of chapter 11 is this. What can Jesus do about death? Okay, Jesus, you can heal some sick people. You can give us a free lunch. Who would have thought? But Jesus, do you have a solution to the sickness that finally gets us all? Death. I mean, a healthy diet and lifestyle, whatever blog or influencer you might follow, can help you live a longer life, beat sickness to some degree. But who can beat death? Who can beat death? You know, nobody likes to talk about death, do they? It's sort of parodied in comedies, sort of hidden away from us in the West, isn't it? We don't want to think about it. We sort of suppress the reality of death or avoid it by pretending it's not really coming. Sort of deploy like a, a toddler, endless delaying tactics. We put our hope in healthcare and cosmetics. But death will visit all of us. When I pass by the church graveyard on the way to services, many of the gravestones are so old. You can't even read them. And it's sad that nobody comes to lay flowers there anymore. The people who once did are now also dead. Forgotten. Their names not remembered. The Bible is clear on this. It says in Psalm 103, Our days are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and then die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never been. <coughs> Death is a reality, whether we want to talk about it or not. C.S. Lewis, who famously wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, was a strong believer in Jesus. And he even gave lectures on the problem of pain and human suffering. But when his wife died, he found himself asking brutally honest questions about God. Questions you maybe have asked as well. And here in John 11, we see Jesus encounter death. And the question that death raises for us all is answered by him. You see, death is our greatest problem. But wonderfully, Jesus is our great solution. Now, this all takes place in the town of Bethany. My daughter's name is Bethany. Here she is, just before going into a recent neon disco. Strike a pose. <laughs> Maybe you know others with the same name, Bethany, but the source of the name is this town in the story. The town of Bethany was slightly outside Jerusalem, and Jesus spent quite a bit of time there. We know from Luke 10 that he knew the people mentioned in our story today. He knew Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They obviously had a close enough relationship such that when Jesus was told by Mary and Martha in verse 3 of chapter 11 that the one he loved was sick, he would have known it was Lazarus they were talking about. And yet listen to Jesus' incredible response in verse 4 if you look down. He says, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. And then of course, Incredibly, after receiving this news, we read in verse 6 that he went straight there. No, no, he didn't, though, did he? He stayed where he was for another two days. He didn't even go to them immediately. It's as if death to him is of no great concern. It's, it's no bother. Jesus is in total control, at total peace, because he has total power. Well, look at the rest of the words in verse 4. Lazarus' sickness will not end in death, but then Jesus goes on. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So after two days, the decision is made to go. And Jesus knew what was coming, 
and he knew it had a higher purpose. That through what was about to happen, people would see just who he really was and come to believe in him. Now we read that when Jesus arrived at Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And Jesus didn't even enter the town for concern of making a big scene. He waited outside for Martha, probably the older sister, to arrive. And when she did, she repeated something to Jesus. She had probably said numerous times since Lazarus had died four days earlier. Verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. She's grasped something of Jesus. She still hasn't grasped fully who he is. And Jesus' words of reply from the next few verses are often read out at funerals. They're words of great hope and comfort in the face of death. Words that anyone who has lost a loved one in Christ will be taking comfort in today and every day. Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. Words that speak the great solution to our great problem. And the question, though, as Jesus rightly asks, is do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do we believe this this morning? People of St. Mary's. You see, Christianity is not so much a belief system, but rather about knowing and trusting in a person. About knowing and believing in Jesus. Now look, maybe you think it's all about being churchy. We've got this lovely building. Knowing about architecture, the different doors, the different times and seasons, liturgies and colours. Maybe you think that's what church is about. It's not. Quite simply, the Christian faith is about Jesus, about knowing him as your great solution to your great problem. You see, Jesus is about to show here that he has power over our great problem of death, the problem we can't solve. So as his followers, we don't have to say, Jesus, we still believe in you despite the reality of death. No, we can say confidently, we believe in you because you are the one who has defeated death, who gives life beyond the grave. Because you are the resurrection and the life. In answer to Jesus' question, do you believe? We can say, yes, we believe. In the next few verses, a similar scene to that with Martha unfolded with the other sister, Mary. You see there in verse 30 that uh, Jesus still stayed outside the village. And Mary there says to him in verse 32, Again, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The sisters had obviously had this discussion together. Remember that upon hearing the news of Lazarus' illness, of course, Jesus had stayed where he was for a further two days. Questions must have abounded. Does Jesus not care? Why did he not show urgency? I think the answer John wants us to take from that is that Jesus knows it's all okay. Look at what he says in verse 11. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Guys, Lazarus has overslept. He went for a kip. But he really needs to get up now. So I'm going to head on over to Bethany and give him a nudge. Jesus is is so calm, so at peace with death. For him, it's no more than a long, deep sleep. A sleep from which he can awake anyone he chooses. That's why on some gravestones you may have seen the words, fallen asleep in Jesus. That's where those words are taken from, this passage here. 
But the, the disciples don't get it in verse 12. So Jesus tells them plainly in verse 14. He says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. <laughs> Sorry, what, Jesus? You're glad. Glad. Yes, he's glad because as he says, this is so that God will be glorified, leading to greater belief. So in one sense, Jesus sees the divine purpose in this suffering and loss. He knows that through it, he will be glorified. People will come to faith in him. He knows death, although a big problem for us, is no big problem for him. But in another sense, the reality of death affects Jesus deeply. Look at what happens in verse 33 as he sees Mary and the crowd weeping. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I've always pictured Jesus getting upset, but it goes further than that here. He's deeply affected. His eyes swell with tears. Verse 35 is the shortest in the Bible, Bible, yet reveals so much. Jesus wept. He was being confronted by death. Seeing the effects of this fallen world where, for all of us, death is a reality. Words simply were not enough. He wept. Just as when we face death, we weep. And there's a sense that at times no words can convey how terrible death is. Writing a card to someone who recently lost a loved one, all I could write was, I have no words. I only pray for God's comfort. Death brings the end of that special friendship or relationship, whether with mother or father, Wife or husband, daughter or son. And here as Jesus witnesses the effect of death, he breaks down and weeps. He asks to go to the tomb and then even in verse 58 we read he is still deeply moved. What is your hope beyond the grave this morning, I wonder? Maybe like the ostrich, you put your head in the sand and covered it with life goals and a bucket list of experiences to hit before that day. Maybe you've decided that you don't need hope. That's for weak people who need a crutch. It's just an illusion anyway. Everything we've heard from new atheism. But it just doesn't ring with human experience. We long for death to not be the end. I've never met anyone at a funeral who says to me, well, I guess that was it then. We invent these euphemisms that we don't really know what they mean, but they give us something to hang on to, another star in the sky. Have a drink for me up there, Uncle Dave. Don't hide away from it. Jesus wants you to be honest about death before him because he has the answer. He offers you true hope in the face of your great problem. The problem that humanity in all its Apparent hubris at times just cannot solve the coming reality for us all. As Tolstoy said, what meaning of my life does the inevitability of death not destroy? See, if this is it, if this is it, then our lives really have meaning that's very hollow. But Jesus says there is more. And here we see him grieving, weeping at the sight of death. And yet he shows his power. Look down at verse 39. Take away the stone. Take away the stone. <laughs> but Lord, said Martha, <laughs> by this time there's a bad odour. For he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, 
Come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let him go. He's alive. I've woken him from his sleep. Of course, Jesus had said earlier that he was going to bring glory to the Father. That glory would be brought to him. That he would give the disciples another opportunity to believe in him, to grasp who he was. And of course, it did all those things. It gave the disciples the opportunity to see that Jesus wasn't just the one who could turn water into wine and heal the sick and feed the 5,000 and walk on water. But he's also the one who conquers death. God over all, the resurrection and the life. It would be easy to think this story is just about Lazarus, something interesting that happened about 2,000 years ago. But it isn't. You see, Lazarus would die again one day. As much as there was joy that Lazarus was now alive again, in time he would die. As do we all. The death rate for humans is 100%. No, this story is ultimately about Jesus and his power over death. It's about more than something that happened to one person in a small community in the ancient Near East 2,000 years ago. It's something that speaks to all of humanity, to you and I today. It's about the glory of God. It's about what happens to those of us, to you and I, if we put our trust in him. It's about gaining victory over death by entering into a relationship with the one who has the power to deliver you from death. The one who can truly defeat it. The one who is the resurrection and the life. The one who will one day say to you, just as he said to Lazarus, come out, wake up, rise from your sleep to new life. You see, Lazarus' resurrection was a picture of a bigger coming reality. We all die, but Jesus says that if we believe and follow him, We can have eternal life. But how do we know that? How do we know we can trust him? Well, the events that followed ultimately led to Jesus' own death. Something we will remember more fully in a few weekends' time at Easter. And Jesus could face his own death because he himself was the resurrection and the life. He knew he would beat death. If you're bereaved or anxious about death this morning, there's hope, real hope. There's hope that God understands in your grief how you're feeling because Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Jesus faced death and saw its darkness, saw its pain, its bitterness and gall. He understands. And with Jesus, there's hope beyond the grave because as he says... Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. There is life beyond the grave. It is not an exitless box. Maybe you're here this morning and you think that as long as you live a long and rich life, then death won't be so bad. That's rubbish. I've taken funerals for so many people. They didn't want to die and neither did their family. Whenever death comes, it's awful. And yes, it can feel far worse when it seems that a life is taken too soon. But it's always terrible. And there are no solutions to death outside of Jesus that this world can offer you. Only works of fiction or the vain hope of cryogenics. Jesus is the only solution to your great problem. So are you trusting your life and death into his hands today? He asks you, as he did then, that question. Do you believe? Amen.
Phil, thank you so much indeed for those really encouraging words. As Jesus raised the dead and rose from the dead himself, as Phil was just saying, and where he said all those who believe in him, even though they die, will live, and everyone else who believes in him will never, never die. It's illustrative, it's indicative that he has conquered death and has promised us all, through faith in him, the most wonderful future, an eternal future. This is in whom we can put our trust our Lord Jesus. So please stand to sing. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in Jesus. as we've just sung of this trust in Jesus. Let's remain standing and proclaim this trust and belief publicly together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being in life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, we're only 12 days away from Good Friday. And of course, it's called good because as with our theme today, through the death of Jesus on the cross, Jesus defeated death 
We're about to sing a verse which says, Hey, what a glorious day. What a glorious way that you have saved me. So let's remain standing and sing to the King of glory. Oh, happy day, you wash my sin away. Would you please be seated and let me finish with a verse from scripture. The Apostle Peter said, Praise be to the glory to the God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of, the, of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation. So Father God, we do indeed thank and praise you that you have given us through faith in Jesus, this living hope that can never be taken from us, this inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, and this glorious deposit which, in ke which is kept in heaven for us all. Father, shield us through your power, protect us and guard us, and help us all to grow in faith and trust in you all the more day by day, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus in the sure and certain truth that death has lost its sting, and a glorious future awaits your daughters and sons through faith in him. 
Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may he be with us and with those whom we love, both now and for always. Amen. So go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope you can join us for a cup or after. Thank you.